Welcome to the University of Utah Faraday Chemistry Lectures. You may not know it, but chemistry is everywhere. If you can see, hear, touch, feel, or taste it, that's chemistry. Please join us for an exciting evening of experiments, fun, and learning at the Faraday Lectures. Welcome to the Faraday Christmas Lectures. We are thrilled that you're here tonight, and I want to tell you a little bit about the Faraday Lecture. They started centuries ago in Britain. Michael Faraday, an incredible scientist, he started a series of public lectures at the Royal Institution to get people excited about science, and they were really the hot ticket in London. And we've had a tradition of doing this at Utah. But it's kind of a concern. Faraday was a very distinguished individual, and I'm not really Michael Faraday. I'm not sure about this hat, and I see somebody in the audience who would probably look better in this hat. Let's welcome Utah's original Professor Faraday, Ron Ragsdale. <laughs> Glad you're with us tonight, Ron. The original Faraday lectures given by Professors Ron Ragsdale and Jerry Driscoll here at the University of Utah entertained and educated audiences of all ages. Like Tom said, we are honored to carry on this tradition and are thrilled that you're here with us tonight. We couldn't have picked a better venue. The University of Utah Department of Chemistry is home to cutting edge research groups creating solutions to an array of modern day problems. We have research groups working on making new ways to harness energy by formulating biocatalysts and nanostructures, stopping drug resistance by inventing new antibiotics, and using the fastest computers in the world to predict fundamental properties of matter. Tonight's lecture is full of fun topics that we hope will both inspire you as well as bring out the child and the scientist in all of us. You know, Faraday's first lecture was on the chemical history of a candle, and you can tell that Professor Louie and I need a little help with our candles. And how should we start a lecture like this? I think we need to start it appropriately with some fire. What do you think? Yeah. So let's start this off right. Here we go. So one way we can figure out that a chemical reaction has taken place is we see a change in energy. There's other ways to decide if a chemical reaction is taking place. My favorite way is color change. Now you can see in this bottle that there's a liquid in here. It's actually colorless. It looks white because the bottle's white, but we would call it without color. In fact, you might think it's water. I'm kind of thirsty, so maybe I should take a sip. Is that the best way to test a solution out? <laughs> a way a chemist might test what the solution is is by using an indicator that would react with a chemical if it's in the solution and turn it into a different color. And so I'm going to put just a couple of drops of indicator in these beakers and we're just going to see if this colorless solution changes color when it reacts with the indicator. And you can see I'm not putting a lot. They're not really colored themselves. Only a little bit her beaker. Now 
I was thinking about this early, you might think, oh, she's just putting food coloring in here, but we can see that this is also colorless. All right, so let's see what happens when I put this colorless solution in. And one of the things we count on you guys for during this talk is to help us out and make observations as scientists. Is anything happening? What do you predict the next thing to happen? How, how about the last one? Good thing I didn't take a swig of this solution. So we can use colors in lots of ways to understand chemical reactions. Here is something you might have taken on a camping trip, some dry ice, and we're going to add it to our test tube and see if we can determine whether any chemical reactions are taking place. And so again, we want to think about, is a color change taking place? And this is kind of a neat reaction because it mixes itself as the carbon dioxide, I hope we're not contributing to global warming, escapes into the atmosphere. And this also changes what chemists call the pH of the solution. Right now it's getting kind of yellow, but we're here at the University of Utah, so that suggests if we add even more acid, what color might happen. And we can continue to monitor our reaction, and the color gives us a window as to what's going on. The purple actually is a basic solution, and we'll make it a little more purple because that's kind of pretty, and you can see how it's mixing away as the CO2 evaporates and bubbles off, and in the end you can get a pretty neat rainbow. Um, and this is the sort of way a chemist would understand is a lake getting too acidic due to global warming or excess CO2. And so, again, our eyes are a way we can really observe and think about how chemistry happens. Now, color change is a great way, as Tom said, for us to have a window of something that's happening chemically. And if you look over there, there's a periodic table with a variety of elements in it, and every element is unique. Every element holds in its uh, casing, if you will, a certain amount of energy. And depending on the levels of energy, they give off different colors. And so if we can turn down the lights, we'll see if we burn some of these elements, they might give off a different color. Now again, let's predict what we might see or observe what we might see. So we see a nice green color, a nice orange color, but what color do we really like here at the University of Utah? Red. Red, exactly. And so you'll notice right here that this blue color is starting, starting to get an inkling of red. And as we keep looking at it, the red overtakes the blue. <laughs> So as we can see from these different colors, different elements have different energy. And this experiment is really special because it was actually embedded here at the University of Utah. You know, we can also see chemistry using household materials. Here's aluminum foil. How many of you guys have aluminum foil in your kitchen? That kind of concerns me because aluminum is a very reactive metal. Now we know it's a metal because it's shiny, can conduct electricity, and we use it all the time. And so let's see if we can use this aluminum foil in a Utah context that might be important to a large hole in the ground on the other side of the valley. 
and that involves copper. So here's copper sulfate, the beautiful blue color. And let's see, I'm a little worried about this because of the reactivity of aluminum foil. Careful, Tom, careful. You have your safety equipment on, right? I have my glasses on, so let's see what happens as we add copper sulfate to aluminum foil. And again, you guys are my eyes here. Make some observations. Look, look in closely and tell me what's happening. Nothing. You know, and it, it turns out nothing is a valid scientific observation. And so I'm going to take another chemical from your kitchen. And let's see what happens if we add some salt to this particular mixture. Is something happening? So there's a color change that indicates maybe something's happening. Is anything else happening? Uh, <laughs> I think I better stand back now. <laughs> And then start thinking, have you ever seen that brownish color before? So maybe rust? We started with copper sulfate, so what does that make you think of? You big spenders out there, like Professor Ragsdale, would be happy to loan me a penny, but not much more in different areas. And, and so what we did was illustrate maybe something that might happen to our cars in the winter where we put a lot of salt on the road, and corrosion is accelerated. So the, the salt actually helped break down the oxide layer on aluminum. Believe it or not, our dean, Professor Henry White, actually did some nanoscale studies of this particular property using the latest technology that almost lets you see individual atoms and understand corrosion like this. So, as maybe you can tell from the first couple of experiments that I did, is I really like color change. So, again, I'm going to have some clear liquids, I'm going to pour them in, and what you'll see is a nice yellowy orange color. Right? So, we have a nice yellow orange color. Right? No, no, are, blue? It, are you sure? Wait, no, yellow orange. Right, yellow orange. How can you guys keep saying blue? I, you mix the stuff together and it turns yellow orange. Right? Blue? Oh my god, you're right, it is... Wait a minute, it keeps changing color. So this reaction is actually called an oscillating clock because it oscillates between yellow and blue. And what we have here is three reactions. A goes to B, that's one color, let's call that yellow-orange. B goes to C, it turns blue, but then a loop reaction that turns C back into A, depending on the concentration, gives us the time each color has. So, pretty cool, huh? Those colors aren't quite the Christmas season colors, however. I wonder if we can do anything about that. Yeah, you know what? I have an elf at home. His name is Buddy, and I have a, a, his sister, Jolly. How many of you guys have any elves at home? Maybe on a shelf or something-ish, right? So Buddy and Jolly are so nice. They came and taught me how to make Christmas ornaments. It is the holidays, and so I'm going to share this recipe with you. They said to mix a little of this ammonia complex. Ooh, that doesn't look like a Christmas ornament. I better keep going. Hmm, this looks a little bit more like mud than Christmas. So let's see if I can turn this into a 
better color. Yeah, that's nicer. So Buddy then said to pour some of this other solution in. Ooh, mm, still not Christmassy. Let's, let's add a little bit more of this magic reactant here, ammonia. And really what I'm doing is creating the special reagent to react with this solution over here that will allow me to make the Christmas ornament. There we go. So now we have the right reagent that can react with this starch solution. And at first it makes yellow, and then back to this muddyish color. But like we said, we don't want to put a muddy ornament on our tree. So let's try to see what may be happening as I swirl the solution around. You see anything happening? I, I heard the magic word over here say it again. It starts with an S. Silver. Do you guys start seeing the mirror ornament? And by the magic of TV, Tom has one already prepared so we can show you a little bit more closely the magic of silver plating making Christmas ornaments. Those reagents reacted and plated silver on the flask. Do you see yourself? <laughs> Recognize anybody in there? <laughs> So we've been observing chemical reactions and we want to switch gears a little bit and chemistry is all about the study of matter and I have a feeling we're going to work with yeah. some more phases of matter. I have some really cool matter here. This is called liquid nitrogen. You could see that it evaporates really quickly. So liquid nitrogen is about you know, we know it's cold outside, but this is about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit in here. And let's take a better look at it. And we're going to fill our bottles with a little bit of the liquid as well. So you can see there's liquid trapped in here. This would be a soda bottle you would not want to cap. And we'll show you exactly why that is. So let's cap it with some balloons. <laughs> Our vice president for research is leaning away. I don't know why. He's been well trained and educated because we're going to remove these bottles from their cooling baths and let the liquid nitrogen warm up. And the scientific question here is, which takes up more space, a liquid or a gas? So we'll just sort of make some observations and sort of see what happens and see how big our balloons will get. You know, the first way scientists learn to understand and quantitate matter was really by studying gases in hot air balloons and all sorts of other things. And, you know, there is probably a little bit of tension in a hot air balloon flight and I guess there might be a little tension in this particular experiment. You guys should be making a prediction about what might happen. Pop. Pop. What, exactly, what happens when a balloon gets too much gas in it? Pop. And so as you're discovering, maybe the front row seats weren't the perfect idea for this particular lecture. But clearly our balloons have more than doubled, tripled, 100 times the volume of the gas. And I'm sort of going to spend the rest of the lecture over here, I think, as we explore the properties of gases. I know, these are pretty festive balloons. Do you think we should just let them hang out here? 
Or maybe we should push them along. Let's maybe break this balloon. <laughs> So there we've gotten a little excitement from gases. Gases are a lot of fun. Oh yes, gases are really cool. I think those balloons are probably filled with some gas, right Tom? And the good news is this demonstration is a peaceful and quieter demonstration. We each have a sample of a gas. Ah, uh, whoops. Hmm. <laughs> is that normally what happens when you blow up a balloon with gas? No, that might suggest that the gas that's in there is a little different than what we would think of, of putting into balloon. Mine, on the other hand, is floating quite nicely. It's held by a heavier metal piece, so it won't float up. But let's explore what happens when we do something unchemistry-like with chemicals. Some of you may have tried this experiment at a birthday party. Me, I want a hula hoop. <laughs> we can hardly stand the weight. Please, Christmas, don't be late. So again, you've made a hypothesis of why the helium perhaps changed the range of Professor Louie's voice. I have a heavier gas. Let's. Try that experiment. <laughs> and I think I will be able to start a new career, perhaps in the movies. Can you guys think what sort of movie I should be in? I sort of think I could be Darth Vader in Star Wars. And with my deep voice, perhaps I can ask Professor Louie for a date. <laughs> Chris will beat your butt. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that didn't work very well, but the gas in here is called sulfur hexafluoride, and it's actually a very important gas used in the semiconductor industry and other technical applications and it replaces other more toxic uh, substitutes, aside from having kind of this unusual effect. And my voice. Thanks, guys. I think here in Utah, when we think of different gases and different states of matter, what we are really famous for is snow. And where does snow come from? From clouds, exactly. And so let's see if we can generate some indoor clouds. I think we have some dry ice here and still some liquid nitrogen. The dry ice. Woo. So we're going to add some liquid nitrogen to it. So we're taking something cold and making it even colder. But, you know, on an evening like tonight, I think we better warm things up just a little bit. And so let's add some energy to matter and see what happens. So this is actually what happens in cloud formation. We have water in different physical states caused by different temperature ranges. And now we're going to get back into the festive mood. Yeah. 
so the way chemists study many things is by adding energy to matter. You might have also noted Woo. Professor Louie put on some safety equipment and so you want to pretend, let's get back to the Star Wars theme, consider yourself Princess Leia. All right, so over here we have a balloon that floats filled with what we would normally fill a balloon, helium. And the prediction is that I'm going to add some energy and it'll pop. So let's see. Yeah, it popped. Did it sound any different than when you would normally pop a balloon? No. So in this balloon, we have a slightly different gas. It's also very light. It's hydrogen. And hydrogen is flammable. That means it reacts with fire. Let's see if that's the case. <laughs> Did it pop differently than the first balloon? Softer, louder. That loudness comes from the fact that the hydrogen is reacting with the oxygen in the air and making water. Now there's actually not that much oxygen in the air. The hydrogen molecules have to find the oxygen. So let's see what happens when we actually purposely put oxygen right next to the hydrogen. So that balloon has both hydrogen and oxygen so that the hydrogen doesn't need to go find the oxygen. Why are you putting those on, Janice? Um, I like to be fashionable. <laughs> That's kind of an inelegant way to start a reaction, just starting a fire. And one of the things that chemists do is develop new and clever ways to control reactions using catalysts. And we're going to see if a catalyst is effective. So here's a bottle that contains a highly flammable and explosive even mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Oh my god. But apparently, just dropping it wasn't enough. Didn't put enough energy in to make these molecules react. It may have made a few of you react, <laughs> but that's one of the fun things about teaching, is having reactive students. And what we want to explore is if we can start this reaction not with a flame, but with a catalyst. You all drove here in a car with a catalytic converter. And we're going to explore that same metal, palladium. It's famous for a lot of reasons in Utah. So let's add that to our flask. And you notice we're both putting on ear protection. We've already talked about Star Wars, so pretend you're Princess Leia. So again, we asked the scientists in a room, did a chemical reaction take place? You know, the nice thing about reactions is that usually they go faster or more stuff happens the more reactants you put in it. And so I think we have a bigger bottle that has more of this reaction mixture in it. So let's see what happens when we add the same amount of catalyst. <laughs> now, chemists actually have to work on large scales sometime, so I think we better see if we let's can Let's do the big one. Let's scale up the reaction. Are you ready? Uh, 
you know, our colleague Jeff Statler, come on out, Jeff, you deserve a round of applause. You can see he really cares about us because he forgot to fill that one. <laughs> now, catalysis is very important. It's the way we make all the molecules that are important in our society. Refining gasoline, synthesizing new medicines. And so we want to understand catalysis, but maybe in a little quieter way. So let's get a test tube. And we're going to explore the chemistry of catalysis with a chemical that you can find under your bathroom sink. This is hydrogen peroxide. But for some reason, they gave me 10 times stronger hydrogen peroxide than what's under your sink. And what we're going to see, if we can control the reaction of hydrogen peroxide, and of course, chemists measure things. And so we'll put about 100 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide in here. And I think we're just going to explore one catalyst today. This catalyst is a catalyst I call Southern Utah. It's red rock or orange rock, and that means it's iron. And so we're going to see how this potential catalyst might interact with hydrogen peroxide. And remember, you guys are the scientists in the room. So let's start out and make an observation. What color? OK. What color? Let's see what happens when we mix them together. And now try to decide, is a chemical reaction taking place? What color is this now? And one of the exciting things about a catalyst, those high school students here, think about what your biology teacher calls a catalyst. Um, but we can use it over and over again. So I'm going to add some more peroxide. I'm not going to add quite as much this time. Let's see what happens. And so we could continue to use this catalyst to destroy hydrogen peroxide. In your body, you have catalysts that are designed to do exactly that because hydrogen peroxide is a molecule that is formed sometimes as you process oxygen with your body. So we have catalysts in your body called enzymes that can destroy otherwise a very reactive molecule. And a lot of you have done this experiment after you cut your finger. Think about what happens with a cut finger and a little hydrogen peroxide. It stings and it bubbles. And that's pretty much what we saw right here. And so catalysis is really a clever way to control chemical reactions. But let's get back to energy. Yes. In these bottles, we have what may be considered an alternative fuel, methanol. Maybe we can see what happens when we light a fuel on fire. Again, we like to try these things on scale. Because some of you might have missed that, and uh, it would be easier to see it bigger. And we'll just sort of mix this well. And you can see there's not an awful lot in there. And we don't want to have too much in there as well. How about you, Tom? You know, this has been a long lecture, and I really appreciate your patience. In fact, I'm getting a little hungry. Oh, you weren't supposed to see that. Uh, no, tell me you want a chip? Yeah, let's try a chip. Of course, the reactions when we've been demonstrating at high temperature with flames, we call combustion. When this corn chip does its work in my body, it has another name called metabolism. But essentially, it's the same reaction. Let's see how that works, how our body turns fuel 
like a corn chip, into energy. Now, I know when you read the serving size on that package, it says eight corn chips, and it might have a few calories from fat. It looks like a good emergency candle. <laughs> but this is what your body is doing at room temperature using enzymes in metabolism. But if you had enough close look at this, you'd see the oil coming off. This is the full, this is not the fat-free chip. So imagine eight of these burning in your stomach as you enjoy the game. We're going to try another way to oxidize organic compounds. This is the holiday season, and so we think about candy a lot, don't we? Yes, yeah, so the burning of the... <laughs> <laughs> so the burning of the chip is slow because Oxygen is a very slow reactant, a very slow oxidizer. And what Jeff is doing right now is liquefying a much stronger oxidizer. And so we're going to take candy that may have some calories in it and see what happens. This is a Jolly Rancher. What happens when we do the same oxidation in metabolism a little bit faster? So that's just one piece of candy. Look at all the energy it's producing. Good thing this doesn't happen in our stomachs. <laughs> so another great thing about organic chemistry is they make polymers. And polymers are really important products. They line our clothing, you're sitting on polymers, shoes, insulation, uh, you name it. Polymers are everywhere. And to demonstrate really what polymers are, I think we have some helpers from the audience. Please come down. You know who you are. And so my helpers here are going to be molecules. Because in reality, we can't see an individual molecule. So each one of them are going to pair up to be an individual molecule, right? And we're going to probably want to make two polymer chains, I think. So you'll see that everyone is paired up. We like to dance in the chemistry building here. So all of these couples, right, they're showing you their kinetic energy, dancing around, dancing around. They're all a molecule. They have a functional group represented by their arms. If I were going to ask them to dance around the room, you might imagine that a couple of pairs might hop, skip up to the stairs or over to the side and over that way. We'd have a good old dance party in here. But if we wanted to make a polymer, what we would do is have all of these individual molecules open up and hold hands and make two polymer chains. And now they are stronger as a group, less mobile. If I ask them to dance around the room, a little harder. But they still could. One line could go this way, one line could go the other way. So if we want to make a polymer even stronger so that we don't fall through, that it could hold our weight, we might want to add a different chemical, like a crosslinker to bind the polymers together. And I will be the cross-linker, and so will Tom. Heads? Heads, OK, heads. <laughs> All right. And so if we ask the polymers, chains individually, to go around, they're locked into place by both Tom and I. So we all would have to go as a group, one big polymer mass. All right, thanks, guys. We appreciate it. So we used them because it was much easier to visualize individual molecules with people. I do it all the time in class. But now we're going to, again, visualize making a polymer by adding one group of monomers to another group of monomers. You can think of this kind of like an eighth grade dance. All the girls on one side, all the boys on another. 
Never the two shall meet. But we want the girls to dance with the boys. So we're going to add one to the other. Okay, so you can see that I put the layer of girls on top of the layer of boys. So one monomer on top of the other. And at the interface is where they react. So I'm just going to go in and grab the interface. And what I've made is a polymer that you might have heard of and perhaps even worn, nylon. So this is a nylon rope from the reaction of the pink solution and the clear solution. And I could keep going and going and going, but sometimes it's more fun to do it fast. <laughs> kind of looks like jellyfish. We have another polymer here that you might find in your house in a very important product. Yes. And I think maybe we should demonstrate the properties of this polymer uh, first, and then you can think of its applications and what sort of product you might find it in. So we have a tiny bit of polymer here in the bottom and lots of water. I'm going to add some more. What? So can you think of any applications for the younger set where absorbing a lot of moisture might be a good thing? <laughs> and this polymer, as you can see, the tiny bit absorbs an incredible amount of water. So let's make another polymer that's a lot of fun. And so many polymers are made by mixing two components. And I think we're going to have a little bit of a competition here. I think we're going to have a race. So I want to hear. Go red. Red. And I'm not even sure what color I am here. So. So we need a little more cheering here because we're. This doesn't look fun. Let's react and demonstrate another polymer while this is going. I wonder what's in this bottle. So let's do a hands-on demonstration. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Happening? But wait a minute, something's happening over here. Is the red or the white winning here? And so you can see how a polymer might be used to make something, in this case, would be a very useful insulation material. And polyurethanes are one of the widest used polymers in construction and all sorts of other applications. It looks like they're going to be used in the fashion industry soon. I think so. Well, we'll let this react a little bit more. Why don't you show us some light? We started off with some light and some chemical reactions. And what we're going to work with is an element in the periodic table that's essential to life. It's phosphorus. And phosphorus is in part of your DNA. But I have a special form of phosphorus here. It's actually stored underwater to protect it from oxygen in the air. And if you think about the root name of phosphorus, it sort of sounds like light might be involved. So I'm going to need a different pair of safety glasses for this particular reaction. And I want to react it with oxygen. So we're going to add some liquid oxygen to my flask. And this will displace all the air. And I think if you look at this carefully, besides I can run little races with my liquid oxygen molecules, you can see it's a very faint blue color. And 
And I'm just using it to displace all the air so I'll have essentially pure oxygen in my flask. But I want wait for it to all evaporate. And you can see there's just a little bit of frost forming on the thing because it's getting kind of cold. But now I've filled this up with oxygen. And I'll just let the last little bit drain out. What I'm going to do is try a reaction with phosphorus. And like most reactions, we'll need a little heat to get things going. And so I'm going to warm this rod up and take my piece of phosphorus and I'm going to put it inside my flask with oxygen. And then to get the reaction started, I'm just going to warm up the phosphorus a little bit. And you can see a chemical reaction is taking place that is not only emitting heat, but light. Hence the name phosphorus. But I want to learn more about this solution. The compound that forms here, some of you had had a drink of today. It's in Coca-Cola. So let's see if it acts as an acid or a base by using one of our indicators. And this, I think, is a kind of a fun reaction for Christmas. Have you guys seen any color changes? And so just like Coca-Cola, we have an acidic solution formed from the oxidation product of phosphorus. Now, Tom, I just wanted to show you guys that we took a couple of solutions together and made these really fashionable hats. Try one on. <laughs> Mine has ear protectors. <laughs> what do you think, Tom? Looks good. <laughs> you know, we've had a lot of fun tonight, and we're going to deal with light some more. Let's try another reaction involving the production of light. Here I have two solutions. Solutions that are used in forensics to detect blood. If we turn down the lights, we can see that if I pour one into the other, an oxidation event occurs that creates a luminescent material identical or similar to the ones that some of you have waving around in the audience. Let's see your chemical glow sticks. Wonderful. Now Tom, I think other things give off light besides luminol, don't they? Yeah, we're going to try another reaction that we have a lot of fun with. One of the elements we get out of the Great Salt Lake is magnesium, an important metal because it's very light. And let's see how magnesium reacts by burning it. And so magnesium gives off a very bright light as it burns. And I'm going to try to get more of this magnesium to burn. In this case, the magnesium is sitting on a block of dry ice. And I'm going to heat up this sample a little bit. And we know carbon dioxide can act as a fire extinguisher. So we'll try to test that out with magnesium. So when it's not near the dry ice, it starts burning. I'm going to try to snuff this fire out with another block of dry ice. Is something happening? Wait, Tom, I thought you were putting the fire out. <laughs> Obviously, I, my next career will not be as a fireman.
So one of the classic reactions, I think the reason people come to my chemistry classes sometimes is to see this next reaction. It's called a thermite reaction. It might involve some heat, it might involve some light. Let me orient you. This is a metal pan and in our crucible is a mixture of iron oxide or rust and that same metal we were familiar with early on, aluminum. And we're going to see what happens if we get this reaction started. The last part of that reaction has been done hundreds of times in Salt Lake City when they were putting together the track system. This is how you still weld together the rails on light rail so you don't get a clickety-clack, clickety-clack of railroads. The product is glowing. It's molten iron. But first, let's see how my metal pan did. not very well and then just so you can see that this has produced tremendous amount of heat in this ingot the iron is still molten kind of like at the center of the earth and a lot of heat that warms us up on this last day we really want to thank you for coming out tonight we had a blast doing these demonstrations for you it was so fun for us and we want to and like we started, we want to leave you with a, a Go Utes for the University of Utah with the Block U, as well as ask you again to be scientists and, and predict what might happen when we turn the U around. What do you think we should do with this U? Let's see your Utes. Go Utes already? On three, go Utes. One, two, three. Go Utes! Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching us. We really hope you enjoyed it. But wait, there's more. As an added bonus, there is special slow motion clips. Keep watching. We've had a lot of fun together this evening. But remember, chemistry can be dangerous. All of the experiments tonight have been done in a controlled, safe environment. Please do not try these at home. <laughs>